Hi, today we are in Menlo Park in the Highland Capital Partners Office with Alex. Alex, who are you and what do you do? <laughs> Hi, good to have you guys here. Um, my name is Alex Tausig. I'm a venture capitalist partner at Highland Capital Partners. We are a 26-year-old venture capital firm with uh, offices all around the world, um, and um, we invest in early stage uh, technology companies. So uh, that's both enterprise companies, every, everything from infrastructure software to application software, uh, to consumer internet companies, marketplaces, social media, all that kind of stuff. So, um, and we've been around, as I said, for a while. In Boston, uh, we have our offices where we started the firm. We also have our office out here, as well as in uh, Geneva and in Shanghai. Great, awesome. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? What did you do before you started being a venture capitalist? Yeah, so I have a bit of an, un I guess, unconventional background in, in some sense. Um, so I, I, for a long time growing up, I thought I was going to be a, a professor. And so mm -hmm. I, I was on an academic track for most of my life. Um, started labs when I was a teenager uh, and did a lot of different types of research. It exposed me to a lot of different technology. Uh, so uh, in bioinformatics, computer vision, um, I ended up doing physics and materials engineering um, physics as an undergrad and then mm -hmm. materials engineering as a grad student at MIT. Mm -hmm. And um, it was at some point during the grad school days that I, I, I got a little bit bored of research. You know, it's, uh, it's a bit of a slower pace than yeah. we find in the startup world. And at the same time, I had knew, known a lot of folks that I went to college with at Harvard who had come out to the Valley to start companies or a lot of them at that point in time had actually gone to Microsoft and then come to the Valley. That was, seemed to be a lot of the pattern. Um, and you know, I was at Harvard when, when Facebook started, and so it was part of this generation of sort of new entrepreneurs, and uh, and decided that I wanted to be part of that in some way. And at the time, someone had told me about venture capital, and it was a sort of this interesting intermediary between people that made technology and the financial markets. And uh, having grown up in New York City and been in, in sort of in the in and around the finance community my whole life, I thought that it would be a nice marriage of my passions, you know, for sort of helping capitalize businesses, and then also. Um, you know, uh, working with technologists to help bring their, you know, stuff out of the lab, out of the, uh, the confines of small little, you know, dimly lit rooms into the real world and serving customers. And so I decided to venture capital. I'd like to learn more about what that was. So I ended up going to business school. I, I left MIT, uh, got out of the PhD program and decided to get a master's instead. Um, so I wrote my thesis and then I went over to HBS, Harvard Business School and uh, joined Highland out, out of business school. So I've been with Highland for about five and a half years now and uh, started working in our uh, Boston office um, with one of our founders very closely. And was, he, that was sort of my apprenticeship, mm -hmm. if, you, if you will. Um, and worked very closely with him on a number of companies in the security software space, uh, data warehousing. Um, we invested in a robotics company, okay. which, is, which I'm happy to talk about. It's pretty cool stuff. So we, we like really technically complex problems and, and really amazing engineering founders. Um, and that's really what I've been doing pretty much ever since. Uh, and I moved out here about two and a half years ago to help build our West Coast office. And that's kind of what I've been doing. But I'm sort of a career venture capitalist. Um, and I really uh, am inspired by you know, great innovation, great engineers. And I like to help them sort of explore the transition from inventing great technology and moving into the real world. Actually, from my point of view, there are a lot of similarities between being a professor and an entrepreneur <laughs> or an venture capitalist by building up hypotheses and testing them. The only thing is that as a professor, maybe if you, you can do only the theoretical stuff, yeah. as an entrepreneur and a VC, you also see the consequences. Well, in a, in a laboratory, you're so isolated from the real world. You know, I worked on uh, a project that was trying to create computers, computer chips that ran on light. Mm -hmm. So instead of electricity, a computer chip that runs on light. Yeah. That's a big idea, right? Yeah. And uh, we were totally, um, I mean, as a student, I was totally unaware that Intel would just like totally control this market. Yeah. Right? There was no hope for commercializing this technology as a small company. Um, and, uh, you know, had I known, had I come from the business background, I probably would have figured that out earlier, right? But, um, but that being said, you know, you do a lot of really cutting edge stuff in the lab, but you do it at, at the sort of scale and with the sort of uh, mentorship that doesn't really guide you down the commercial route. Um, I think that we still need to have a lot of work to do on a model that transitions laboratory research out into the real world. And, you know, Stanford over here has done a great job at it. MIT is doing a good job. Harvard's doing a decent job. Um, but there's still a lot of work to do. And uh, I think coming from that world, I, I can kind of walk in both, both, pair, both pairs of shoes, if you will. Um, but... Uh, I see some similarities. There's there's a good amount of sort of the hypothesis-driven testing mm -hmm. you referred to, but um, the practicality is quite different. That's true. And the, the emphasis here is if it's not valuable to a customer, it's not valuable to work on, right. which is very different than in academia. Mm -hmm. 
Let's talk about Highland Capital Partners. What are the typical selection criteria for you to invest in a company? And maybe you can build some kind of matrix depending on ticket size, mm -hmm. industry, where the company is uh, staged, etc. So lots of different venture firms have different approaches. I think mean, we, we can sort of talk about different stages of investing. Um, at, at Highland, we, we are predominantly Series A investors. So we're usually coming in as the first large institutional investor in a company. We're usually the first outside board director um, that's not always the case, but it's usually the case. And we like to think that we have a, a mark on the early you know, formation and, 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 and growth of the company. Uh, and at some point, you know, more capital comes in and other board members come on board. But we like to be the sort of the trusted kind of first person that makes a bet on, on a group of entrepreneurs. And um, you know, as such, our criteria, I mean, like different, different firms think about it differently. Um, there's firms on this road here that focus a lot on market, yeah. or they focus very much on you know, the specifics of the product. Uh, I would say that my focus, and I think most of us here, tend to focus a lot on the team. Mm -hmm. So um, we, are, we very much believe that, that we want to be backing great founders who can really take it the whole way. Um, so anytime, you know, it's sort of a difficult exercise because you're thinking maybe eight, nine years in the future. Right. But we, we think that we have over 26 years developed decent pattern recognition on what makes founders really um, the kind of people who can lead it the whole way. That doesn't mean they always do, but, um, but we, we try to find those criteria. And, and if we look at our own history of, of, of our biggest wins as, as, as a firm, they're usually the ones where founders did go the whole way. So what does that entail? Um, for us, I think uh, in some sectors, you need to bring to the table some sort of relevant expertise from that industry, um, some sort of insight that you would have that a layperson walking into that business wouldn't have. I do think having fresh perspective in some businesses is, is helpful, but if you're building a um, you know, security software company, you know, having a good history of like knowing what features are valuable by, valued by customers uh, is really helpful because once you ship your product, that's mission critical stuff, right? Mm -hmm, right. So having experience from the industry is very important. Um, we often talk about magnetism, like with founders. Like, there's some people that I don't know if you've met, but you just you just go, wow, I really would love to work with that person. Mm -hmm. um, there's a certain amount of optimism, mm -hmm. a certain amount of um, I, what I call just un, unflappable uh, ness, just like someone <laughs> someone who cannot be taken off their path. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, those types of people are very rare to find, mm -hmm. but um, they believe in it so much themselves that other people are willing to take the risk and go with them on the journey. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's something we, we look for. Um, in some ways and shapes and forms, that might be called leadership, but actually leadership has all sorts of other characteristics as well. Mm -hmm. um, leadership isn't just the ability to like guide, you know, get people to go on the journey with you, but it's the ability to actually organize those people into a functioning organization. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, you know, even with very young founders, we, we look for people who have the ability to manage, mm -hmm. who have the ability to partition work and motivate and, and, um, and really help develop uh, their employees. You know, this is not easy stuff. And it's helpful if you've worked in a high-functioning organization before and have seen these patterns, but even first-time founders sometimes have just an, a knack for yeah. that. Um, if it's a highly technical project, uh, we look, frankly, for brilliant world-class engineers. The, mm -hmm. the last company that I, I kind of led the investment for at Highland is the, one of the, C the CTO is one of the guys who helped write Java. Mm -hmm. you know, um, we have our, uh, one of the other founders helped uh, create MapReduce at Google. Mm -hmm. you know, so we really look for people with world-class technical talent because what we found is that there is, between a, a good engineer and a truly great engineer, mm -hmm. there's like a whole order of magnitude and productivity. Mm -hmm. And it's not just their productivity, it's the other talent that they can attract to mm -hmm. the team. So when you back truly great people, they actually form this, this sucking sound in the industry where they get the best talent into that company. And that, of course, reinforces the company's mm -hmm. success. And how do you test this magnetism and, on the other hand, industry knowledge, given that you oftentimes invest in companies that are trying to reshape an industry, and which mm -hmm. is most of the time maybe you don't have direct insights into this industry as well? I mean, the way we test the, the team aspects is we do a lot of references. Mm -hmm. So if we don't know, I mean, ideally, the ideal situation is you've already worked with this person for 20 years. Sure. Right? And you're, 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 you already have the evidence. Well, it happens occasionally, every now and then. But, but you know, a lot of times, you know, teams come out of companies that were successful and start a new company. Mm. And uh, you may have known them by reputation or you may know them socially, but you've never worked with them before. Mm. And what we do there is we do heavy, heavy, deep 
reference checks. Mm -hmm. And we talk to lots of people that have worked with them. We talk to people that have worked with them even like 20 years prior. And we form in our own heads a, a narrative about that person's career. Okay. Uh, and we try to understand what makes them successful, what are their strengths, what are their weaknesses, and we form a thesis around the team. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and like I said, we're not always right, but more often than not, we are. And um, that, that often, when we're right, we actually find that those are the best companies. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we personally, we, personally, when I work in companies, I go very deep on the team mm -hmm. and try to really understand you know, what they're good at and what, what they need from us. And frankly, it helps us think about how we can be helpful as, as a partner. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if this is a very strong technical team, but they don't really have a good business development sense. Like that's something we can try mm -hmm. to bring to the table. We can try to find them someone. We can, first of all, advise them on biz dev, but then we can also go try to find them someone to work in that function. So mm -hmm. um, that's kind of how we, we suss it out. I think the only thing you can do is talk to people who have worked with them before and then form an opinion about mm -hmm. what they need. And how can you find out whether some founder is really able to manage pivots? Like before, I mean, most of the time, the first idea will not be the final idea when you exit right. the company. So that's, so that's another great reason to back teams instead of, instead of right. markets in and, in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, there's this idea that a great team will find a great market. Mm -hmm. The people that believe in markets say that, you know, well, you could put Bill Gates, you take Bill Gates and have him sell ice cream yeah. and he'll never build a hundred billion dollar company yeah. because the market size for ice cream is only so big, right? right? Um, so I, I actually, I, I'm, it's more of a, like a religious conviction, but I think that uh, great teams tend to find new opportunities. We've had companies in the past that started down one direction mm -hmm. and have made pivots into, into several, maybe several times. Um, to the point where, um, you know, I think, I think the good ones tend to stick in the same market, mm -hmm. but they try to change the business model. So a good example would be uh, a portfolio company uh, of ours called ThreadUp, mm -hmm. which is an e-commerce company. Um, you know, when they, when they started out, the idea was to basically be able to exchange clothing with one another. Mm -hmm. So you and I could trade our shirts if we yeah. wanted. That only has so much uh, upside yeah. because there's just not that many people who right. are willing to dig through other people's closets and judge, you know, I like that shirt has yeah. a little bit of a stain on it. I really don't want that one, but I'll take that one. Yeah. It's a lot of work for a consumer, right. right? And it's actually a lot of work for a seller mm -hmm. because they have to figure out, they have to go take everything, photos and put it online. So that company pivoted to become an e-commerce company. Mm -hmm. So meaning that they will actually just buy things from you and they know what they can buy and they know what they what they shouldn't buy okay. and then they go sell it on the internet so for a consumer it just looks like a normal e-commerce store mm -hmm. and for a seller all they do is put all their stuff they want to sell in a bag and just send it in they don't have to worry about it mm -hmm. and that's when the business really took off and that's when we invested okay. um but uh the founders uh, were two guys i went to business school with and i known them for you know god i know i've known them for like five and a half years now yeah. and um you know it, it took it took many years to really figure out what the right model was um, but these guys, by the time they got there, they were experts on that market. There's no one who knows that market better than these guys. Um, and you have to be willing to support founders while they figure that out because it sometimes not everything takes off right from the get-go. So we, back, we try to back great people who we believe have the ability to go figure out what the right business is. Alex, I'm very sure that you see so many pitches a year. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about what makes a great pitch? Mm -hmm. And then maybe tell us a little bit of some examples where you see, okay, this was a great pitch because of X, and this was not mm -hmm. a, a good pitch because of Y. So any great pitch is, uh, is, a, is a great story, right? The, the, great, the best pitchmen and pitch women are the best storytellers. And uh, so the best pitches I've seen have taken me uh, through this opportunity. You gotta, you, gotta, you gotta get people's attention right away. Um, one of the things that kills me is when people don't tell you what the product is <laughs> until like halfway yeah. through the deck. Yeah, yeah. Um, tell me what you're building. Tell me why you're building it. Tell me why the world needs it, right? Get, take me on the journey. Um, tell me who you are and why you guys are the most relevant people to actually go, to go on this journey. Um, and convince me that it's a journey worth going on together. And if you take that attitude, um, as opposed to just kind of giving me a bunch of facts, yeah. um, I think that, that you're already probably halfway there. Um, we, of course, need to decide if it's a fit for us. But um, you'd be surprised how many people come in here and just regurgitate a bunch of facts about a market, a market size and about you know, product metrics and stuff. Yeah. And that works for later stage investors who are more interested in just, I want to invest a dollar and get $3 out. Mm -hmm. For us, we're signing up for eight, nine years of work, potentially. And we have to believe that this is going to change the world. We have to believe that any investment we make is going to return our fund. 
-hmm. you know? Right. Like, so that's a, that's a big, that's multi-billion dollar company. And to do that, you have to believe that it's a generational type of opportunity. Mm -hmm. And for that, you need to be able to like tell us that story. Um, so uh, it's not very specific feedback, but um, to be more specific, I think one of the most interesting things I've seen in the slide deck that I really liked, and I, I really don't see this that often, is um, uh, same company actually, um, ThreadUp. I remember when, when the CEO was pitching us, he said, here's what you have to believe to want to invest in my company. He's like, if you don't believe these things, you shouldn't invest. Yeah. And he listed them. And the interesting thing about doing that is you kind of go through one by one. You go, okay, I, I believe that. I believe that. I believe that. <laughs> yeah. And so you're like, well, I guess I should invest in the company. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so he, he led me down this, this road. And, and it was a very logical argument, yeah. you know? And, um, and I think that, I think that you should, I think more founders should take that type of approach where they're like, look, there's a lot of risk in this venture, you know, but if you believe, but well, here's what we believe. Mm -hmm. And if you believe what we believe, clearly this is, there's, there's a massive opportunity mm -hmm. here. And it doesn't mean we're going to get there. We have to execute on it. But what VCs look for is the optionality. Mm -hmm. They look for, you know, if the execution is, is, is good, can we actually have a huge opportunity? Is there a huge upside? Mm -hmm. And um, so that's what it's all about. It's not about necessarily convincing them that there's no risk. Yeah. Like smart investors know there's risk. Sure. It's about convincing them, them that the upside is there. And for that, you need to believe a certain set of things. And if you don't believe them, you're not gonna believe there's the upside. And when you are saying that the uh, entrepreneurs should tell, tell you a story, do you mean that they should give you a very big, big, um, big picture in terms of, okay, in five to 10 years, we would like to own that and that market? Or do you more want to say, okay, uh, this is, uh, yeah, this is what we want to do in the next two years? I, this, the story, there, there's a combination. So here's how I say it. There's a 10 year roadmap. Like there's a 10 year plan, like not a plan, it's a 10 year vision. That's what I'd say. A 10 year vision. And there's like a six month plan. And so you got to believe in the 10 year vision and then you have to believe in the six month plan. Like what's the next logical milestone we have to hit. And um, so you got to simultaneously sell both of those things. Um, I remember when we, uh, we have a company in our portfolio called to you, which is an online education company. They recently went public. Mm -hmm. And I remember the very first meeting with them. Uh, one of the founders said that, um, There's, look, there's plenty of online colleges you can go to, but they have the wrong incentive system, mm -hmm. right? Um, like if you're, if you are, um, I don't know if they have these in Europe, but um, you know, it, these for-profit education companies like University of Phoenix yeah. or Capella. Open um, University in, it, in, in UK, I guess. Uh, you pay, you, you, you borrow money from the government mm -hmm. um, via Title IV to go to school, and then uh, you, so you load yourself up with debt as mm -hmm. a student, and then you come out with a degree that's not that valuable actually oh, okay. in, in a lot of cases or you may not even finish and so why, why and why is that an endemic problem well it's because they actually don't really have that much incentive for you to be a great like have a great job and a great profession they're kind of in the business of signing you up mm -hmm. and covering their acquisition costs and then moving on to the next student mm -hmm. that that's how they make their money mm -hmm. and sure they'd like you to keep paying your tuition but if you're ultimately not successful in job marketplace it doesn't really affect them whereas if you look at nonprofit schools you know, like, like Harvard or MIT or Yale or, you know, USC or Georgetown or whatever, great schools. Um, they are nonprofits and their mission is to just educate people who will go out into the world and have great careers. And like they build their reputation on the fact that people are educated mm -hmm. and also can have, can have a great career with the degree they get. And in particular with graduate degrees, it's very, very tied to your career because you've already graduated from college. You're going back to school because you want to get to the next level in your yeah. career. Um, so instead of building another online school, Let's go build a company that helps bring these nonprofits on the internet because then they can take their mission and take it global. And you can go from being the number 10 program in your field to being the number one, uh, and we can help give you those tools to go online. And, and we're now aligned with our school partners. So to me, it was a very compelling vision of the future. Um, and I think in every vision of the future, Where, where that actually ends up in retrospect working, mm -hmm. it's always a bit controversial when you first hear it. Okay. Like today, like this was like, I don't know, 2009 or something when we first heard this. I mean, today online education is like, you know, mm -hmm. kind of going mainstream. Back then it was not. Yeah. And, um, and so there was a lot of controversy. Well, will schools sign up for this? Will schools like want online students coming to their universities? Will that dilute our brand? Mm -hmm. And it turns out it's like the best thing in the world for their brand. Because they basically, 
you know, there's students around the world that never had heard of these guys, and now they're getting degrees, and now they're going into the workplace, and people are seeing their, that on their resume. Um, so it's, it's a transformative company, but it was very controversial at the time, uh, and it required you to think differently, but the story made sense. Like, if you believe this, if you, we can get there, this is a massive opportunity because we'll be the first online education company that's actually aligned with the student for outcomes. Mm -hmm. Alex, imagine a friend of yours or a friend of friend of yours comes to you and says, Alex, I would like to start a company. What would be the best advice that you can give him in terms of uh, financing the company or maybe set him up, setting up a team or later on after he finds management relationships with the board? Well, the first thing I'd say is, why do you want to start a company? So starting a company is really, really hard. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to describe it how how hard it is to, to most people like i mean i guess starting a, a venture-backed kind of company is extremely hard you have no resources um it's it's incredibly difficult to recruit people to your cause it's hard to get that initial traction and you devote so much of your life to actually making this work and you put your yourself and your ego and all that stuff into it your blood sweat and tears um for something that will you know probabilistically not work out There's almost no, and by the way, if you are really good, you're probably leaving some job that was very high paying right. and some lifestyle that you were really accustomed to to go do this. So it's like a very, very difficult thing to do. And I actually think that starting a company is not the right choice for most people. I don't believe that most people are founders or have mm -hmm. the ability to be founders. Um, uh, but I also believe that in this culture we have right now, where it seems to be very popular to romanticize mm -hmm. people that found companies, that a lot of people think they are that person. And so the first thing I tell people to do is just do a gut check. Mm -hmm. um, it's to just basically say, am I willing, here's, my, here's what I would tell people, are you willing to work on this idea for two years with no traction? Mm -hmm. Like if, if you're willing to do it for two years with zero traction, then you probably have the, the, the grit and the fortitude to actually make it the whole way. Because I have a lot of friends who have started very successful companies for which the first two years of that, they had nothing. Yeah. And, and what separates them from everyone else that went by the wayside was the fact that they actually stuck with it. Yeah. And so you got to be able to do that. And if you can do that, you have a higher chance of being successful. So that's the first thing I would say to them is, do you want to spend two years of your life on something that potentially has zero, zero attraction and still want to go? Go for it. So that's, the, that's, that's what I would say. Okay, great. And in terms of financing, what would you recommend to your friend? In terms of, I mean, he is very young and he is trying to set up uh, not that much capital intensive, intensive business. The first round should honestly, I mean, I had some good advice from a professor in business school um, who, you know, you, business school is funny. You don't, you don't remember a lot of the stuff you're told, but every now and then there's a little nugget that sticks in your head. And this one always stuck in my head, which was the person who's likely to write you the first check mm -hmm. is not going to do it because of your business. They're going to do it because of you. Mm -hmm. Right? So they're going to they're gonna do it because they want to see you succeed. So I think the first thing you should do if you're thinking about financing a company when you're just starting it, just flat out starting it, is go find the people who want you to be successful and will back you because it's you. Mm -hmm. so, one, and then, so get those people. Then the next people you get should be extremely high profile and have a great reputation in the industry you're focused on. And so instead of trying to go out and raise money from like, a hundred random people yeah. focus on like the 10 highly relevant people because it turns out the way fundraising works mm -hmm. is that once you get one or two of those people everyone else will want to be in the round right so you spend 80 percent of your effort on on the really highly relevant highly visible people mm -hmm. once you get them it's like going bowling like all the other pins will just start to fall over um so that's usually the advice i give people um uh, at that stage uh And I would honestly take money from as few individuals as you can and still be able to raise enough. Um, the more people you add to the cap table, the more angry phone calls you have to deal with. Where's my, you know, where's my money? How you, oh, how are you guys doing? Actually, oftentimes the most annoying ones aren't the angry ones. It's the, hey, how are things going? Can I come by and check it out? Like, you don't want to manage a lot of, a lot of people. You want to have low maintenance investors and have as few of them as possible, in my view. Um, Because you want to focus on the building the business and not on managing the investor yeah. relationship. Fundraising for most entrepreneurs is a nuisance. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's some that actually enjoy it. Um, they tend to also be very good at it. Um, but uh, most people I know really dislike fundraising mm -hmm. and would prefer not to spend a lot of time on it. And I think that's probably right. You know, when I meet people uh, I, I, and, and we're interested in investing in the company, I tell them, look, 
here's, here's what I need to do to, to get to the point where we, we're going to decide we're going to make an investment. And I want to use your time as judiciously as possible because I know this is not the fun part, right? The fun part is building the business. And, um, and then when, when I go on the board, you know, we're going to have a long, long relationship to work together. So right now is, right now is the time where we need to feel each other out yeah. and I need to answer some questions. And so um, I think good investors will be judicious, judicious with their use of your time mm -hmm. and bad investors will waste your time. Right. Um, Alex, um, you have seen so many startups. Uh, what, what learnings or mistakes have you seen when uh, young entrepreneurs are trying to scale the company? I'll tell you a couple of things. I mean, there's a classic trying to scale your company before you really f truly have product market fit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, investing a lot of dollars behind, say, a paid marketing campaign mm -hmm. um, when you really don't even know what your contribution margins are mm -hmm. or, you know, if that's not the relevant metric, when you don't know, like, the type of users you're trying to acquire mm -hmm. um, doesn't make a lot of sense. There's always tests you can perform, but really scaling out those efforts prematurely, that can burn through a lot of cash very quickly. Right. Um, and ideally, m when you're in that early stage, the cash you're spending is really should be going to support your, your, your team mm -hmm. um, not, and not much else. One other thing is I, error I've seen is relying on business development to drive early traction. Okay. So it turns out that other people are never going to be as good at selling your product as you will. Yeah. And um, if you're going to rely on channels or partnerships to push your product through, uh, it's really, really chunky. And it's really difficult to motivate those parties to actually work hard for you because they have a ton of other priorities as well. So uh, I'm not a big fan of like channel businesses early on. I'm not a big fan of businesses that are driven by business development partnerships early on. I think you need to find a way as a startup to, to, to control your own destiny in some sense. Develop direct relationships with your customers um, and, or your users and, and figure out how to get those people to actually help you grow. Um, so I've, I've seen those mistakes probably most often with, with regard to scaling. Okay. Alex, thank you very much for your time. And next time you are pitching to Alex, now you know how <laughs> a great pitch looks like. And please consider that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Thanks for having me.